Wszystko zaczęło się od króla Jagiełły. Mała Łodzia stała się miastem, które w XIX wieku rozwijało się najszybciej na świecie. W ciągu zaledwie 60 lat od powstania pierwszej manufaktury powstaje przemysłowa, wielonarodowościowa metropolia. Jednak wiatry historii nie zawsze jej sprzyjały. To, co zniszczył los, odbudowują łodzianie. Nasza Łódź. Miasto wielkich szans. Od 600 lat w sercu Polski i Europy. Jesteśmy Polakami. Jesteśmy niezwykłym społeczeństwem. Zawsze w obliczu wielkiego wyzwania potrafimy się mobilizować. Potrafimy stawić czoła wielkim wyzwaniom. Bo nie potrafimy stać obojętnie. Bo obchodzi nas bezpieczeństwo i przyszłość naszych dzieci. Bo wierzymy, że nadzieja zwycięża apatię, lęk i strach. Bo mimo wszelkich przeciwności nigdy się nie poddajemy. Potrafimy ciężko pracować, wspierać się i działać razem. Bo zależy nam na naszej ojczyźnie, naszym osiedlu, naszej ulicy. Bo chcemy naszych niezbywalnych praw i wolności. Bo nie oddamy naszych marzeń. Nadchodzi punkt zwrotny. Dobry wieczór Państwu. Dziękuję, że Państwo przyszliście na nasz panel. Ja nazywam się Roman Imielski, jestem zastępcą redaktora Naczelnego Gazety Wyborczej, a ze mną wspaniały. Thank you for attending our panel. Um, our, my name is Roman Imielski, uh, deputy uh, chief editor of Gazeta Wyborcza. Uh, we have uh, two English speaking guests, so if you don't uh, speak English, you can get a headset at the entrance to the room. Um, Wanda Sanchez comes up of the Sobich Collegium Civitas, Director of Public Policy Center. Adam Tadaczek, Director of More in Common Poland, and Łukasz Pawłowski, President of the Polish Research Group. Now we need to stick to the schedule. So, um, First, I'd like Christian um, Morehouse to uh, introduce um, the panel to present an introduction. I'd like our panel, our guests, to ask a lot of questions. Um, a lot is going on um, in research, so I'm pretty sure you would like to know more about it. So, uh, Crystal Morehouse, Open Society Foundation. Stage is yours. One of the things that I do is to support research. And research for democracy, I think, is something that can help strengthen societies and democracies. It can help build community. It can help bring us together. There are many different types of research, and of course, research for democracy isn't anything new, but there are some new ways in which we can understand society that I'd like to talk about and share and frame. And I know some of the panelists here are deeply involved in that kind of research, and they'll be able to explain further. So, for example, when we look at a society, at a country, what we can know as individuals is very much about who we interact with. And part of the problem of today's society is that we can end up in bubbles. We can end up interacting with people who are very much like us. And we can end up dis dis distancing ourselves from people who have different opinions. And so quickly, our view of the world can be skewed. And we can very easily misunderstand, misinterpret people that are part of our society, uh, that are not in our immediate vicinity. So one way of understanding society is through polling. 
polling is understanding a representative sample of who is in society, what the attitudes are like. There are different ways in which polling can give us insights. For example, we can understand frequency. Frequency is this percentage of people think one thing and another percentage think the opposite, for example. That allows us to scratch the surface as to where people stand on issues that we really care about. But we can go deeper in understanding society through polling. There are ways to understand um, segments of society, so likeness. How does society group together? What commonalities do they share? What attitudes do they hold? And this is something um, that you can do through regression analysis, for example, or through cl cluster analysis, and you can come up with different segments of society. And in that analysis, you can define which variables are the ones that are really moving society. Is it their attitude toward democracy? Is it their attitude toward abortion? Is it their attitude toward faith and church? And so what we can do through polling is more understand more than just 70% of people think this and 30% of people think that, but we can actually see how are societies gravitating together and what are the issues that are moving uh, any given society. And over time, we can see how that could shift. So polling, I think, is one very interesting way of understanding society. It's a way that civil society can understand the groups which share their views, that share their values, and it can help us reach out to those people who share our values. Another way that we can apply research for democracy is through social listening analysis. And lucky for us, we have an expert here <laughs> today in that field. But our digital space tells us a lot of things. We get our feed right on whichever platforms that we frequent, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is that we use, we get our feeds. But each of the um, users that are on a public platform, they also leave a digital footprint. And we can understand by looking at the landscape of digital footprints, what people are talking about, who clusters together, who is sharing content. And so when we're working on an issue like women's rights, we can see, for example, who is actually sharing content that is getting distributed, that other people find interesting, are picking up and sharing. And this can help us also build communities as civil society when we understand that through research. Another aspect of civil uh, uh, research for democracy, and then I'll leave it there because I know we, we are uh, many and short on time, it's focus groups. So the uh, qualitative research of talking to people and really understanding how they see their society, what are their top level concerns, what is it that they um, want to see uh, in their society, how they want to see it change. These are all ways of, of listening to people that go beyond our bubble, and they're ways that research and civil society can combine to be able to better talk to people, to find people that share the same values, and to build communities with them online and offline. Thank you. Thank you very much. In Poland, we are at a time of um, leading up to elections, so we have plenty of research going on, but, uh, surveys. Speaking to what um, Madam uh, Morehouse said, of course, uh, research helps us understand the trends and behaviors. It can help us build a better society where we understand each other well, better, uh, we work for the common good, uh, to uh, get out of our silos or bubbles, so on and so forth. But I'd like to start with a provocative question to our guests. Isn't it the case that we live in a terror of research? We have uh, elections coming, whether it's Poland, Spain, or Great Britain. Each uh, political party um, conducts uh, polls, very detailed polls. And for example, they can see, I'll give an example from Poland, but 
I could provide many examples. In Poland, for example, Polish people don't like increasing retirement age, even though it is in the interest of our society and country. What do political parties do? They follow the research. Of course, in Poland, no political party says that they want to increase um, retirement age. It was done by Donald Tusk's government and it was one of the uh, reasons why they failed in 2015 at the elections, of course, in addition to many other causes. But so the research at the disposal of politicians make them lose uh, heart in many areas. They lose, um, let's say, uh, voters. So isn't it the case that the research that we have does not help us build a better society because we have a problem with immigration across Europe. It's a very significant um, part of public debate in all elections that we have had uh, over the past in our elections. Next year, we'll have um, Euro Parliament elections. So probably a lot of parties having research results saying what they say they adopt a increasingly anti-immigration uh, course even bordering on populism or uh, xenophobia so i'd like to ask um, um, madame sanchez uh, isn't it the case that we live um, in, in a situation we're terrorized by research and that research prevents us uh, prevents uh, improvement Hi, everyone. Okay, that's the first time I'm talking on the mic. Um, I mean, well, in my view, all the political all the political parties in all democracies are using research to obviously adjust the message. And I think that what you're saying is interesting. And my, obviously, as you say, damage a little bit the outputs of what we want to build. However, I think that it's useful to understand, just, you know, like before everything happens, how we need to communicate to that people and what it worries them. Because if we know that in advance, and we can use like data research in this case for doing so, we are able to interlink their worries with our solutions, or what the solution of the, of the political party in this, in this case. Um, there are like, I don't know, like a long, a long t over the time, um, we saw these situations where research and opinion pools ha have been done and the output was positive, right? Like in many countries, Northern Ireland, um, I don't know, like um, Germany, we have like different countries that based on opinion polls were able also to adopt or to integrate same-sex marriage, for example. So I think that is useful and it's a tool that it's out there. The thing is how you utilize it. That is my opinion. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to give the floor to Robert Sobiech. Thank you very much for the invitation. I knew it would be a difficult question, but uh, uh, briefly I would say a few sentences that are obvious and a few less uh, um, obvious. Well, political parties, opinion polls and knowledge. And if you look at a party uh, uh, like uh, from the perspective of the organization, well, a political party is uh, a structure uh, which is there uh, to please its voters and uh, its allies. If we look it, it doesn't differ very much from a company making shoes or computers or except for two things. Well, like a, any business, the political party wants to know what its uh, voters will buy or not. But the political party uh, 
whether it's uh, going to rule or not, it, it undergoes this, it, it subjects itself to the test every four years. Well, why people, when people uh, ask me, well, why politicians uh, act as they act? And then I say, well, uh, think, uh, uh, well, just try and, and imagine uh, that you undergo this assessment every four years. And the difference between a political party and a commercial organization is that uh, sometimes this party becomes the ruling party, so it goes beyond the circle of its uh, uh, supporters. Uh, and now I'm coming back to the main question. So what kind of knowledge um, does, a com does a political party want to acquire and what they need it for? Well, this is uh, Crystal used the word attitude. Well, so this is knowledge about the attitudes of those uh, on whom the fate of the party depends. Well, the attitude, that is their knowledge, their emotional uh, attitude to different uh, uh, behaviors, to different aspects. And, and when we look at basic elements of any electoral campaign, uh, we may say there are many studies and uh, researchers uh, that that uh, tell us uh, who polls like, who they don't like, who they want to vote for and not. So let's subject ourselves to what is out there. So let's uh, adjust ourselves to the existing attitudes. But there is a second element. If we look at political parties as ordinary organizations, these organizations or private companies try to convince their customers to buy a new product, to change something. So political parties, uh, be uh, whether ruling parties or not, they are trying to shape their audiences. And the main, the, the key question, well, so I understand that the, that the, that you uh, argue that the parties have given up this job. So they decided it doesn't make sense because people are as they are. Uh, there is something to it. I would give you just one example. I am currently uh, reading the Eurobarometer studies. Uh, this is also a kind of opinion poll, but at the European level. Uh, but they have two samples uh, uh, in Germany from eastern and western part of the country. And uh, it turns out that their attitudes are radically different. Why? Yes, some people might say, well, these eastern uh, Germans, they are different than those living in the West. Uh, somebody would say that uh, it's also how Poland's have been shaped because they have their attitudes that they don't want to change. But, but now the question is, uh, to what extent we can shape these attitudes? In my opinion, and this is my final comment, because I understand that uh, uh, there will be the second round. Well, most parties, uh, political parties in Poland have abdicated. Um, well, taken to the extremes are uh, questions for the referendum. We have uh, in the audience people dealing uh, professionally with opinion polls, and they know that none opinion poll center would have ever asked this question to anyone, any of these questions to anyone. I would, uh, well, a student coming with such questions to me would certainly fail. Can we uh, can we crush this wall? Uh, well, maybe let's. Uh, who of you knows the uh, four questions? All four questions. Well, mm, a brave person. We can take a test. Well, I can't remember them. Well, I know what they are about, but I I, I couldn't quote them. And uh, my final remark, uh, of course, political parties and uh, mainly the ruling parties, uh, they change these attitudes but by what they do. I give you one example. 
uh, if we looked at the um, at the uh, uh, at the relation, uh, at, at, at the attitude of Poles to Ukrainians, and how these attitudes uh, evolved over uh, recent two decades, there is a radical change that can be ob uh, observed. And also the attitude of uh, Ukrainians uh, towards Poles and the Germans was the same. Uh, when we see what happened uh, uh, in the consciousness of uh, Poles over last two decades, uh, uh, their attitude to Germans uh, was better and better. But when you look at the recent uh, uh, opinion polls, uh, it can be damaged very easily. Of course, if we said that politicians just adjust themselves to what they have in the external world, it's not true. You can shape the uh, public opinion, but you may also damage these uh, outcomes. That's uh, what uh, Vanda Sanchez said about the uh, single-sex marriages. After opinion polls, you have realized that, that the attitude is more positive and you can have them. It's a very interesting uh, question whether politicians are hostage to opinion polls. We can look uh, around uh, and we would say they are not, because then we wouldn't discuss migration or limiting uh, migration. We would discuss uh, high prices, energy, security, accommodation, uh, housing, uh, retirement. We uh, had we carried out an opinion poll. Uh, we asked for um, prioritization of five main challenges to the Polish society in the years to come, and we asked about the issues that I have just listed, and also the uh, reduction of migration to Poland. And reduction of migration to Poland uh, was on the 16th position or 17th position with. Uh, uh, very, very little importance. So uh, it means that the politicians try to impact the reality. If they were hostages to opinion polls and if they followed them blindly and if they followed uh, the voice of uh, the majority, uh, that the abortion law would be different currently in, in Poland. Maybe it wouldn't be more liberal than the what we call the abortion compromise, but it wouldn't be um, made more stringent. Uh, we can see a lot of support for the development of green energy uh, in Poland and renew renewable ren uh, energy, uh, but uh, uh, funds have been cut for that. Uh, Many people want to uh, want to withdraw from uh, the reforms of the judiciary. We would have partner. Uh, well, isn't there a contradiction? Because, uh, in my opinion, politicians do it because this is how they can reach out to their voters. Well, that's the next stage, because uh, politicians are not hostages to opinion polls, but they are hostages to their own convictions and their own uh, and their own views of uh, society, and also uh, to those who win elections for them, uh, even if that is not a majority group, even if they don't, uh, well, well, the uh, law and justice didn't have this majority. But what to do about these opinion polls? And it seems that the currently ruling party, the law and justice, they know um, our society the best. So that's, uh, that, that makes it, it easier for them to build coalitions that uh, guarantee the best electoral outcomes for them. They understood the values, the concerns of different social uh, segments of society, the fears fears that they can um, uh, incite or reduce. So, so in this sense, uh, these polls and research uh, are 
important for political parties. It, it's not only about asking people what do you think uh, about A or B, uh, because when we think of single-sex marriages, uh, marriage uh, is a very conservative construct. Uh, and uh, showing it as uh, conservative opens uh, a way to a broader coalition. It takes away the liberal um, dresses of it, and it opens up a broader perspective. But in order to know how to do it, we need to uh, have good knowledge of our society. We need to understand what values are uh, crucial for certain groups, how certain groups understand and interpret certain words. Here, I, I guess, uh, well, the rule of law is understood in a similar way by all of us. Uh, but we carried out a study asking the Pauls uh, about what the rule of law means to them, and there were uh, the, 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 the answers rarely referred to independent uh, to, to the independence of the judiciary. Most people would say that people should be uh, nice and honest uh, uh, to one another. That means that they don't understand the concept. Uh, so. Uh, political communication is not about uh, shouting to potential voters uh, your uh, th uh, to shout out your truths or not to shout to the fish to get out of the water and come to us but to use the uh, re the fishing rod and uh, then um, get closer to your fish uh, and give it what you know it likes. But in order to do that, you have to know society, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do that. Łukasz Pawłos. Good evening. Um, uh, Said uh, we do a lot of research. Not sh so sure about that. Um, said that in Poland uh, we're publishing twice as uh, many polls as uh, several years ago, but still uh, we are still uh, behind the United States. Also in terms of um, the quality, the first question that was asked it doesn't uh, address uh, polls. Should uh, politicians be? guided by what people want or should they decide themselves and the uh, poll is just in the middle it's only a tool for a politician could go uh, to um, let's say a clairvoyant and um, he or she would uh, tell them okay whether people like uh, would like to have a partnership or unions things like that but it really depends on what we are talking about. If we have, okay, to go into detail, should politicians be guided by a pulse or uh, the will of the majority with respect to the adoption of the euro in Poland? Now, uh, people um, who know that um, mo the majority of people do not want the euro in Poland, they should say, okay, the politicians should be responsible. Okay, how about uh, the people who do not want to increase the um, increase retirement age? But once we think, okay, we are in the minority and our uh, poll can help us. For example, abortion law in Poland. So after the uh, ruling of a constitutional tribunal, the greatest uh, change of views in Poland before that, about 30% of Polish people said that about 30% uh, of Polish people said abortion uh, up to the 12th week without any conditions is okay. Today it's 60%. So. Uh, right now, it appears that the opposition parties, uh, for example, Donald uh, 
Tusk decided that he's, he was going to bet on that. So where the politicians are guided by, um, by uh, public opinion or not, influences their success. A third way, for example, the great majority of voters uh, support abortion up to the 12th week, but the leaders of those parties are uh, deeply opposed and they say, okay, we need to uh, have a referendum because it's their internal value is uh, opposite. They said, okay, no, it, it depends on the politician's conscience. So we have two values. Either pol politicians use their conscience and they do what is right. And I'd say that uh, the spirit of the Unia Wolności is here. It's a uh, Unia Wolności always thought that those politicians thought they, they knew better and they're no longer in, in uh, politics. Yes, but uh, of course, but uh, many of those politicians are still around, but un in different parties. But to finish this thought, the critical issue is whether or not politicians should listen to um, polls. So good polls can be very helpful in many processes. Now, the thing is, if the politicians do not agree with the public opinion, for example, in terms of the euro, they should uh, put in a lot of energy to convince uh, public opinion rather than impose things. One of the foundations for change in 2015 was that um, a major reform, a major reform was introduced, that is uh, increasing um, retirement age without social consensus because that leads to a change of um, power. So uh, that led to a different political option uh, coming into power and at the same time they did a lot of other things like they spoiled the uh, rule of law and so on and so forth. So the politicians must follow the will of the people and I'm um, very fortunate that the, the the director of a, a polling company, no clairvoyant knows the answers. Now, um, I think that your um, utterances were not uh, long at all. I think it's our public's view as well. Okay, let's say we have these polls, this research. So, Uh, politicians is only one on the groups that we help, but also NGOs, uh, Open Society Foundation, for instance. So what's the optimal use of uh, polls that we have? On the one hand, we have this awareness, it's, um, which is a major threat in many regions of the world, that uh, democracy will destroy itself. Because how do nationalists work? They also poll their voters. They um, figure out their fears and concerns, and they use them in their campaigns. So your perspective. So what? What should this uh, look like, this uh, functioning of the state, NGOs, polls, um, how to talk to people in Spain many years ago? So abortion was a, a major problem introduced by, by left and it was successful, it's still there. Dave, I think that uh, is not utilize in the best way possible for pro democracies organization but also for political parties I'm going to say um, but I think it is a very useful tool to to within a more resilient um, system for those that are not familiarized with social listening. A brief description is that uh, it's an activity that allows us to monitor and to analyze online conversations, organic, like it, it's 
slightly different from pools, from surveys, where um, someone can, can answer a question based on how the question has been made, right? Um, and here it's, it's organic. And the only advantage of, of this um, ecosystem is that we can track um, real-time activity, right? Having all that knowledge in your hands allows you to track narratives, you know, like frames, actors, um, even consumption in terms of media, etc. And that's and that's it's going to bring you like a lot of insights. Once you have like analyzed and once you have detect what works and what doesn't in the digital ecosystem, who are your allies and who are your detractors? You can like make like a really great use of it. First one is to monitor authoritarian narratives, right? Um, so you will have like um, if, if if you are skilled, you you will have like some advantages in terms of um, being able to identify when someone is out there, what they are pushing, but how much effort you should put in tackling. Because maybe it's a narrative that no one is going to buy, that hasn't, hasn't got the potential, right, to reach meetable audiences or even, I don't know, like um, other audiences. But what happens if it is? You can work from your side. You can work with your allies. And you can start, start building narratives very carefully. Because sometimes we made this mistake of, um, of pushing oppositional narratives by creating reactive content, right? We need to be like very careful. We need to provide information, but solutions as well. And you know, like also this positive imaginarium that you know, like if my view works, how the world would like could look like, right? But. As one said, you are able to identify influencers, you are able to, to uh, talk to people as well. If you are able to utilize, for example, social media, you are able to create a community, right? Um, other things you can do is to, do you know the people out there, is to perhaps build a successful campaign, as I'm pretty sure that Liberty will do to, you know, to, to create like uh, to mobilize audiences and, and vote on the elections. So one quick example I'm going to, to put and I want to, uh, I don't know, like show, show up a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, we did um, a research in partnership with Liberté and with Natalia from Liberté, which might be around there, very useful, <laughs> uh, very skilled girl there. Uh, we did a research um, that Outside of all these topics that we know they were like really important in politics, we needed to identify like some of them that we can use as a, catal as a catalyst for activating people and go, you know, like to, to vote. So our assumption was, you know, like different, but we ended up identifying, you know, like, um, you know, like the abortion, the abortion law was, um, Super positive. There are like a lot of findings in there. For example, when talking about, um, you know, like in terms of which platforms we can utilize to, you know, like to have this conversation, um, to who, to which people we should talk, right, to help us to drive this. Um, and everything looks very positive here, but wait, everything is look. You know, it's very positive, but at the same time, it's, there isn't any really like positive narrative, which is legit because here the law is it's very, very restrictive and very uh, tough. Um, so we are having a lot of angry women, as I think we should be anyways, um, you know, like trying to trying to be like, yeah, trying to be like um, positive narratives to, to mobilize. And yeah, um, basically um, we are getting like some insights about what is missing there, 
we know what they have, we know what people that can work need, so let's, let's work on that. On the other hand, this is um, something that it really gets our attention in terms of um, oppositional parties. It seems like it wasn't like any negative kind of uh, oppositional narratives over there on, on politicians. And you might think, wow, everything like looks fantastic in the digital ecosystem. No, it is not. The law no, the law no. Now, it is how the ruling party wants. So, obviously, they don't want to. They don't want to create a debate in something that could, perhaps, um, damage them. Um, but yeah, I think that there are like several ways of utilizing that to having that information and all the things you can do for good. I mean. Thank you very much. Tutaj, e, właśnie chcę wrzucić taki kamyczek tutaj. Yes, I want, before I give the floor to the rest of panelists, uh, what was very important in what Wanda Sanchez has said, how to communicate it, uh, because people don't want to uh, hear something that the politicians want to impose on them. Th that's very important. Well, we. Uh, well, th you need to have a good narrative, and 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 the law and justice uh, successfully did it in 2015, and 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 continues sticking to it. Robert Sobiek, the floor is yours. Well, a lot of uh, issues. I don't want to interfere with issues like the quality of. Uh, Paul's Vanda mentioned the narrative and different ways of uh, uh, researching, serving, and studying. It's like photography. You can take a beautiful photo uh, having a poor uh, quality camera. Uh, you can also have a um, very detailed photo uh, from computer tomography. But I, I would like to tell you about one paradox which uh, is interesting to all sociologists. Well, the main question is how to support democracy, how to prevent uh, the ruling uh, authority from becoming more and more authorit authoritarian. And there are different uh, very good studies across the world. And what do they show? They show us that in most societies, we are doing uh, we are going away from democracy. When you try to analyze the quality of democracy, uh, like the, the economists of Freedom House uh, do it, uh, people are turning away from democracy. Uh, full democracies. Uh, are uh, countries where 8% of people live, while the rest uh, democracies are uh, hybrid uh, democracies or authoritarian uh, rules. That shows that increasingly more countries go away from democratic standards. I will give you just two examples. Poland and Hungary, the countries which used to be in our regions, their role models for democracy and democratic standards, they are dropping down. They are just uh, in these rankings. Well, just those uh, can two countries, not Czechs, not Li uh, not Lithuanians, mm, but these are expert polls, which show that and. If you ask Poles or Hungarians, it turns out that uh, in these uh, Poles, uh, uh, most uh, most uh, Poles don't believe that the situation is deteriorating. Well, uh, there is a well, we know that uh, that there is quite a big group of people which say that the democracy is okay, and that's why law and justice wins uh, the elections. Uh, there is an American center 
that conduct such studies or polls. They look at trust in the government and satisfaction. Uh, and it's the greatest in China, Azerbaijan, uh, and where we have authoritarian rule. But uh, when you do opinion polls, most uh, Vietnamese and Chinese people say uh, democracy is fine. So why do these people uh, say that? Don't they understand what it is all about? So probably these polls, even if they are very well structured at the technical level, they probably, uh, th there is one failure. Uh, because if we look at uh, uh, polls from before the war, the Russian uh, polls, where, where the trust in uh, in the, um, government is not the, as high as in China. But the, but if we look at the support for Putin, it's really very high. But does it mean that the Russians are really like that, or maybe there is an interfering? Uh, factor which makes these people say yes yes i support putin i think democracy is doing well in our country because that's the question of differences in these systems because if my answer is different then i may be get in trouble maybe not direct consequences but mm, i will be um profiled by this poll center. Uh, a sociologist, a German sociologist, Nofert, uh, well, used the term, mm, well, uh, she, she, she noticed, she realized that people, when they realize that their opinion is not ma in the majority, they say, I don't know, not to uh, give their real opinion. But coming back to Polish reality, well, in Poland at the uh, Opinion Poll Center, which is financed by the Prime Minister Chancellery, but it's a good research center. Uh, they have uh, reliable samples, good uh, analytical uh, stuff. And what do we see in this uh, poll? So the recent poll said that the difference between the first and the second par political uh, party uh, in the um, run for elections is 20 percentage points. Support for the left or for the so-called third road or third path doesn't exist anymore. This poll center says that 20 percent of people say we don't know who we are going to vote for and my th thesis is that it's not a technical mistake it's just that people are afraid because when they are asked by uh, an ex center they want to be on the safe side especially when they know that this is the government poll center So if uh, somebody asks me how good are these pre-election polls, well, they are uh, quite reliable, but they don't take uh, into account one thing, because in one poll, uh, you, you from one poll you learn that 80 percent of polls go to uh, are going to vote and in the second one you learn from the second one you learn that only 50 percent of polls will vote uh, so you can have very good tools and instruments and if they if they are used in a specific context then we end up with uh, such paradoxes Adam Tracek, the floor is yours. I will come back to the question that was asked at the beginning of the second round. That is, what can these polls give to democracy? What can they give to actors uh, promoting democratic uh, values? Well, good polls uh, or good service uh, make us 
challenge our own assumptions and stereotypes uh, that we have. Uh, so, for example, the protection of democracy in Poland. What is democracy? Democracy, democracy is not a, a theoretical construct. It's, it's, it's not a, a collection of sophisticated laws, uh, constitutions, regulations, but it's a living construct in which we live uh, our everyday lives. And if this is a living organism, it's also experienced by our citizens. Uh, so so, so we, we should think uh, uh, what this democracy means to them. Two, ye two years ago, we published a report on the understanding of democracy because we discussed it with Poles during focus groups and, and also uh, in a big survey. And we asked them uh, what uh, was the impact of uh, uh, giving 500 slotted for each child uh, to the families uh, has it impacted our democracy because because many there were opinions saying that polls sold democracy for five, five, 500 slot most polls uh, assess democracy in a positive way Democracy is a tool that is supposed to be used for something. It's supposed to be used for improving the living standards of people. So it's nothing about selling themselves, but it's enough to look into textbooks and manuals which tell us what democracy is about. The advantage of democracy over authoritarian rule is that democracies are more efficient in ensuring well-being, higher quality of public services, better uh, st standards of living, and that's uh, why uh, it's better, uh, but climate, uh, we uh, worked on a big uh, study on social segmentation where we divided, uh, uh, where we, we broken down Polish society by values, by attitudes in political life to see how they respond to different uh, stimuli and to different subjects. And climate is one of uh, such subjects, although the, and, and this study will become public in two weeks' time. We presented a preview to some uh, climate-oriented uh, NGOs, uh, and we uh, thought together with them, well, because uh, uh, climate uh, crisis is uh, a reality, how to convince Poles that it's a subject that should be discussed, because uh, sometimes we say, well, it's all fine. We have 1,000 1, likes on Facebook, but the problem is that they come from the same people, For, but, but nothing changes for years. Uh, and these uh, 1,000 likes may be all people in Poland, of course I exaggerate, uh, who are interested in the subject. And we realized in the in our study that the climate and the protection of climate is a part of their political um, identity, and that they account only for 6%. So that's not a, a lot. So we were trying to find out war values are important to other people when they think about climate change and environment. And it turned out that there are many of them to different people, different values or different stimuli uh, are more or less persuasive. For economic liberals, it's the economic calculus, um, modernization of the economy to very conservative people. Uh, it's nostalgia uh, because they are losing the beauty of Poland, where the beauty of Poland is also a big stimuli to people uh, who have with conservative views. So better understanding to whom we address our message, how we build coalitions, how we get support, not necessarily 50 plus one, uh, but a wider coalition, wider coalitions, uh, and, and we can uh, 
put in place deeper transformation if we understand the values in our societies and how can we combine we our political party with NGOs, uh, churches, uh, uh, trade unions uh, to reach out to all the people and they may be reached out with different messages but we also have to be open-minded and good studies and polls should open our minds Łukasz Pawłowski will be finishing soon so I will try and give you a brief response so Briefly speaking, well, polls give us knowledge and what we do with this knowledge depends on us, on the politicians, whether they use it in a good way and uh, to, to find out what uh, raises emotions. But I'd like to draw your attention to one thing. It's not polls that are a problem. Uh, we are the problem. How can we cope and digest outcomes that we disagree with? I love when people say, I don't trust this, uh, uh, this uh, poll. The polls are not religion. We, uh, uh, this example of the government um, uh, opinion poll center, uh, that were the, op the ruling party and the opposition were very close to each other. And suddenly, uh, and everybody trusted it and everybody believed that was okay. Uh, but there are face-to-face -face polls which historically are inaccurate and if the opposition party gets higher uh, we agree with that when it's the opposite well we don't need it this is the government poll so we are the problem because we have to be wise enough to be able to come to terms with outcomes that we disagree with. Uh, if we accept them, if we understand that they are there, rather than saying that uh, the, that the, this is a false, this is disinformation, uh, and and because if we come to terms with that and we start analyzing this data we start drawing conclusions. And my impression is that for these eight years, we are still at the first uh, stage. We haven't come to terms with the reality. We see the result of the uh, uh, elections, but we uh, push it away uh, and we disregard them. If we, un if we start understanding them, maybe we make decisions to change something. Thank you very much. We have 37 seconds left. Thank you very much, Łukasz, for uh, sticking to the time. Yes, yes, I promised you que asking questions, but of course, pan of course, panelists are available to you outside of the room. It's worth asking questions. I'm an optimist, and I hope that this non-liberal, anti-democratic waves will disappear. I hope that uh, uh, we will not uh, escape from freedom, as Erich Fromm put it, mm, that liberal democracy also through polls and uh, the common, the joint effort of different uh, communities will uh, produce better societies in which we will live. Thank you very much and I'm asking you for the round of applause. Jestem z zawodu lekarzem. Zajmowałam się diagnostyką chorób nowotworowych. W Białorusi zajmowałam się mikrobiologią, molekularną biologią. Byłem nauczycielem szkoły podstawowej. Naszym celem jest budowanie umiejętności, które są ważne na polskim rynku pracy. Szybko nabierają takiej pewności siebie, bardzo szybko się uczą. Wszystko możliwe, kiedy starasz się.
Dzień dobry. To znaczy, myśmy się dzisiaj widzieli. Wie pan co, e, ja zmieniłem zdanie i chciałbym poprawić. Karty. W urnie. Dobrze? To ja sobie poszukam. Serio? Pan sobie poszuka? Nadchodzące wybory są zbyt ważne, by zostawić je bez kontroli. Dołącz do obywatelskiej kontroli wyborów. Zróbmy wybory bez pizzy. It's not always easy to recognize. It may look like this. Or like this. It may be a burden. But it is a responsibility that we embrace nonetheless. But if it means this for one person and this for someone else, maybe it ultimately means being there for one another. It isn't handed to us, but we know where to find it and how it feels, how it tastes, and what it sounds like when we finally have it. It means different things to different people, but for many, it means everything. And if we all fight for it, it will eventually bring us together. Każdy wybór ma swoje konsekwencje. Dziś na kazaniu o takich jak ty mówili, że to morderczynie. A wiesz, że ta, która ci pomogła, trafi za kraty? Trzeba mieć sumienie. Jak mogłaś to zrobić własnej matce? Aborcja to najgorsza zbrodnia. Gdybym ja podjęła taką decyzję, nie byłoby cię tutaj. Organy państwa nie będą przyglądać się temu obojętnie. Życie i zdrowie kobiety jest najważniejsze. Stop kryminalizacji aborcji. Kobieta decyduje.